All right, so uh, let's get started. Uh, good afternoon. Welcome to the uh, a weekly uh, serious uh, security seminar series. Uh, today, it's my great uh, pleasure to welcome uh, Dr. Shar Sample from Idaho National Lab. Uh, Dr. Sample is the chief cybersecurity research scientist for the Cyber Core Division at uh, INL, and she is a visiting academic at the University of Warwick, uh, Coventry, United Kingdom, and a guest lecturer at the Bournemouth University, RPI, and Royal Holloway University. Uh, Dr. Sample has over 20 years of experience in the uh, information security industry, and uh, her research focuses on deception, the role of cultural values in cybersecurity events. And more recently, she has begun researching the relationship between human cognition and machines. Uh, presently, Dr. Sample is continuing research on modeling cyber behaviors uh, by culture, and other areas of research are data resilience, cyber physical systems, and uh, industrial control systems. So let us welcome Thank Dr. you, Sample. Danyang. Uh, so welcome to the talk on cultural values and cybersecurity. Uh, we're going to explore the relationship. This is a little different uh, pace than probably what you're used to from uh, some of the other talks we, we listened to today. I, I know that I've heard a bit about uh, nuclear, cyber physical, and whatnot. Uh, this kind of falls under the threat intelligence umbrella. So we'll go through uh, basically um, the intro as the outline you know, here of uh, what, why, why we're doing this, um, the background, why this research, um, some of the studies that I have already done, some of the studies that are ongoing, and then uh, open it up for question, question and answer. Um, because uh, we do have a kind of tight timeline and I tend to run over, feel free to interrupt me if I say something that doesn't make any sense. Uh, introduction. So you've, I know we hear this here, I've been hearing it all day here about uh, the interdisciplinary nature of cybersecurity because it does touch all the different disciplines. Um, and we keep hearing, yes, we need this interdisciplinary approach, but nobody seems to um, be able to settle on what this, dis, in it, what this approach looks like. I'm, I have been suggesting that maybe we need to uh, not only think differently, but we need to learn these other disciplines and um, incorporate from them the models into our work so that when we're talking to somebody about, if, if we're talking about cultural values, we should be able to speak like a sociologist uh, who happens to know cybersecurity, not a cybersecurity person trying to uh, convince the sociologist that we know what we're talking about and they, we, they have nothing important to say. Similarly with psychology, mathematics, computer science, physics, any of these other topics here. So. Um, this talk actually covers the results um, of taking the interdisciplinary approach to provide additional insights into threat intelligence research. Um, so what I did when I, uh, this was uh, based on work that I did for my dissertation, that's where it started. And from there I went on and um, I worked several years at, at the Army Research Lab down in Adelphi, Maryland and got to do some more with it and I got to, that was uh, the basis for my fellowship also. So um, what I did was I said, let's take sociology and what we know about data science and what we know about cybersecurity, and let's pull these three together and see what we can come up with study-wise. So um, there's a little thought that there's going to be this um, single internet um, culture that's supposed to arise. Everybody's going to fall, fall around the same technical issues and say, oh, yes, I see the world the way you do, and this is great. We have one. Yeah, it's not happening. Uh, that's, that's not never going to happen, in fact. Uh, why? Because we think differently. Um, based on where you grew up and what your values are, you will group data differently. And you will, uh, as a result, because you group the data differently, you will come up with attacks that we don't normally anticipate. So one of the things that I, always gets to me is we say, I hear um, lots of people say, we're going to have this single culture. And I'm like, then why are you surprised at the inventiveness of our adversaries? Why are you shocked when they come at you with something that you hadn't thought about before? If we all are thinking the same, you should have thought about it. So it uh, doesn't happen. Have you ever worked on an international team? Um, so I look here and I look around the room and I think we have an international population in this room. And have you noticed that there are different habits and different ways and methods to get to the end result? But we sometimes, we somehow find a way to get to the right answer, even if we took different paths to get there. And that's kind of what we want to tap in on, because when we're talking about cybersecurity and threat intelligence, we're not really interested in a single attack, although that gives us some insight. We're really interested in the attack campaign so that we can get to the various steps that they're taking along the way in the campaign and figure out how we can give the most effective response. And sometimes the most re effective response is not shutting them down, but rather frustrating them. So uh, cultural values and biases are unconsciously, uh, they 
unconsciously inform many of our decisions. So even when we think that we are uh, thinking something through, we're not really. We, we just think we're in control. Uh, truth of the matter is we're not. Because if you take, if you look at the, uh, since we're all, I'm going to assume most of us are, um, have a technical background and prefer numbers to words. Um, so when we talk about conscious and unconscious thought, you'll appreciate this little uh, tr piece of trivia. If we're concentrating on something consciously, we process that information at 40 to 60 bits per second. Okay? But our unconscious thought that's going on all around, well, like, like I'm talking right now, and you listen to me at 40 to 60 bits per second, but you're noticing other things about me, you're noticing other things about the room, and you're processing that at 11 million bits per second. So which one do you think is going to ha um, have more say when you make your decisions? Other interesting thing about uh, biases, we can spot the biases in others, but not so much with ourselves. So uh, we can say, wow, that's great anchoring biases you have there. Meanwhile, we're, we've totally missed ours. Um, this has serious implications when we're trying to profile cyber actors because, again, our biases are getting in the way of what we're seeing. So um, something else that is of interest, uh, we find that cultural values are very enduring. Um, now, it is true, when you move to another country, you will pick up the values of that new country, but the, it doesn't fully embed itself into the um, family, into the structure, the family structure, until the third generation. And even then, having grown up, um, I think I'm, what, fourth generation? Yeah, third or fourth generation in my family. No, fourth. I still see in my parent, you know, I see in my parents some of the old values that um, I was like, are you kidding? Nobody does that. What, do this in our house, you know, so um, it still takes a little while longer. And we find that as, as uh, certain communities live together, too, they, they reinforce those old cultural values, so there's an even longer transition on it. So technology may be universal, but the thought processes are not. And this was Hofstede, whose framework, cultural framework I used. That's one of his quotes. So I said, I'm not really good about having to do, deal with interviewing people. Anybody like the Big Bang Theory? Uh, so, okay. So there was a time, there was one episode where I think Amy asked Sheldon about whether he wants to do experiments on humans. And I think he said that was like one of the few forms of inter human interaction that he actually liked, he found enjoyable. So that's kind of how, I'm, I'm not Sheldon, but I do find it a little difficult to do, deal with people one-on-one. Um, -on -one. So I thought, let's find data and I can use observables and go ahead and do it this way. You know, um, what, 11 million records can't be wrong, right? So um, I said, if I do that, I've got to find ways to, I'm going to have to process it like a, data, think of it like a data scientist, but I want to put it inside this cultural framework. Um, I want to do ob obs observation because I don't want to have to talk to the subjects and worry about injecting my biases or worship, just interacting. Um, then we had the MITRE um, Cybox framework that I wanted to use their cyber observables. And so I, I wanted to put all these together and see what insights I could come up with. Um, something that kind of resonated with me in all of this, if uh, any of you have written any software, of course, you can appreciate this quote, software of the mind is uh, how Hofstede defines culture. And I thought that's a really nice way to uh, think of it because we are kind of programmed to do things. We don't even realize we're doing it. We're processing it so fast. Uh, especially when we're ta talking about the online environment where we don't really have, as, have as much time to sit and evaluate what's happening. We have to kind of respond to the alerts and um, uh, um, informational messages that we get. Um, interestingly enough, um, when I was out at work, uh, Professor uh, um, Tim Watson actually uh, turned me on to this book called um, The Geography of Thought by Richard Nisbet. And something that he had done was he looked at a bunch of studies. He and his, uh, he looked at several um, of studies that were done by various people and his, one of his big insights was based on cultural background, people literally see the world differently. And so for us in the West who often, uh, we teach things in terms of objects, we say, uh, you know, this is the, you know, we, we have a server, you're going to attack the server, you're going to do this, this, and this. That is a very different perspective than someone who may look at it functionally and say the server is, is just one piece of a, of a multi-step uh, process that I need to get through to uh, handle, manage this function. So um, when you consider it that way, then you say, wow, if they're looking at that differently, what else are we looking at differently? Uh, culture and uh, Dominic Gus, who was also helpful on my dissertation, uh, pointed me to some, some work, and he was actually the one who pointed me to the cultural uh, framework by Hofstede, uh, so went, went on to say that culture influences problem, perception, solution, and formation and selection of your um, 
solutions. So what he was basically done, he had done some simulator tests uh, where he looked at students um, from various countries and he grouped them together. So he had students from India, Brazil, and I forget the other countries. I think Germany was one of them and I forget which other, he had two other countries in there. And what he did was he put them in the simulator and they had to um, respond in how they would res um, maintain the temperature. Uh, I think hot and cold was one of his studies. And he would, on his end, he'd be uh, tweaking with the temperature. And he found that some students were very dramatic in their changes and others were more slow to um, try to, you know, they were more gradual in their processing. And amongst other things, he found out as he talked to this, as he dealt, done a, had performed his experiments, and I guess spoke to the students, he found that the uh, way that the people looked at the problem itself, that was one issue. And then how they came up with the, the list of possible solutions, that was another cultural bias, um, culturally based um, inference there. And then finally, how they selected it, again, culturally um, influenced. So why this research? Because a lot of people have done, uh, we've had uh, scientists do studies on uh, psychological traits, and they found that their, uh, their success rate was not uh, significant enough to be able to actually um, go with it and say, this is, what we, this is how we're going to predict. Because psychology looks at the individual, culture looks at the groups. So what psychology does is it gives, it's a subset here that tells us I can look at certain behaviors based on your psychological profile, but understanding your norms, that comes from your culture. So you may, I may say, um, if I want to do this attack at you, mm, that's kind of a bridge too far. I, I can't, you know, maybe I, I've defaced something of yours and I'm going to not, I, I'm going to rub your nose in it. Or maybe I might say, no, I'm not going to rub their nose in it. That's just way too, that's, that's not very cool. That's not very nice. So that's, what, that's where my cultural values come in. Um, again, we know that uh, nations behave differently. How do we know this? Because um, when we're looking in threat intelligence, we have these things called TTPs, right? Tactics, techniques, and procedures. And we collect them and we separate them out. And we say, well, we know that this group does this and we do this group. All I'm suggesting is that we take these groupings of the different TTPs and how do we put them in a cultural framework? Um, and apparently somebody liked my suggestion. So the folks over at the DSTO in um, UK, they said they put together a matrix on human responses and behaviors online. And they said, oh, we, we like that you did quantitative analysis and that you used a well-known framework. So they're using, my, uh, they're using this method as, and these studies in their um, matrix. So what's our real out desired outcome? What do we really want to get out of this? Well, we want better insights into our adversaries and into ourselves, too. So okay, some good studies to uh, let you know about before we... Uh, get kicking off here. There's a study called the WEIRD study. This is probably one of the best studies done in psychology. Um, actually, all the fr uh, when I was working at ARL, all the behavioral scientists were surprised that I knew about the WEIRD study. They said, oh, do you know about the WEIRD study? I said, well, I did do a little homework here. Uh, the WEIRD study, WEIRD stands for Western um, Educated Industrial Rich Developed. OK, that's the acronym there. What they found in the WEIRD study was that the vast majority of the studies that had been done on psychology um, was, and I'm going to get, probably get my numbers flipped here, but at least 80% of them had been done on Western students, on these weird students. And out of that group of Western students, the vast majority of those were American students. So uh, we find that when, uh, if you talk to some of the psychologists, they will be so bold as to say that psychology is the study of American college students. So that was a little joke. You don't have to laugh, though. Um, so we find that the, um, uh, so that was Henry Kine and Noren Zayn, and they did this study back in 2010, and that became like a landmark study. Gus, Gus and Dorner, uh, Dominic Gus was very helpful. I mentioned about his uh, simulators and, and some of the decision making. He's looking at how we make decisions on the fly, um, and he was looking at how cultural values influence that. There was a nice study by, done by Morgan Cross and Randell, uh, who said nothing makes sense except in the co context of culture. Uh, here they're talking about how um, the, you can, you may not understand why somebody makes a decision they make, but when you put it in terms of cultural values, then suddenly everything falls into place. Because that's, again, where, what's normal, what, what are the norms being established, and how we're even trained, when we're trained at school and education in general, uh, whoever is training us, they're transmitting their cultural values onto us also. Um, we found that uh, Michael Minkoff in 2013 had found that students from restrained cultures or closed societies were actually better at math and science than their students from indulgent countries, which was kind of an interesting find. And has um, uh, you know, when you put all these things together, you say to yourself, 
what does this all mean in cyber? Surely we're not you know, all thinking the same then. Um, culture and thought. Uh, Nisbet also talked about the East-West divide. That's actually the, uh, the big, um, fluck, uh, big push in his book is about the cultural divide between East-West. And he noticed that students from the East tended to do better at algebra and arithmetic, and the Western's uh, counterparts tended to do better with um, geometry. Why was this? It was because when a lot of these students, um, and they looked at different studies, of course, that had been done. A lot of the students from the West, when they're growing up, and they, when, even when they're toddlers, right, and they're learning words, they're learning um, the words in terms of objects, like ball, cat, dog. Uh, students from the Eastern cultures were learning. Um, when they learn the words, they're learning them like in function. So I think one of the ones that uh, they gave in as, as an example was um, one of the languages, there's no regular word for white, but it's like the white of snow, the white of um, cloud or whatever. So there's, there's different types of definitions to, the, to a, a word that we just assume is an ad, adjective. What he also found, there was another study done where they found that the students from the um, Eastern cultures had more difficulty separating objects from their surroundings um, So they because uh, they understood the functional relationships, they understood the importance of background uh, data, and the students from the West were worse at being able to understand those relationships, but were better at looking at the objects. So when they changed things in the pictures, what they found was the students from the east, if, you, if there were changes in the background, they saw that, but if there were changes in the objects up front, they didn't see it. And the students from the west, uh, it was the reverse. If there were changes in the background, they did not detect them as quickly. So, um, so what this means, and we talk about in, in threat intelligence, and particularly in uh, cyber deceptions, we talk about managing perception. But what has to happen before you can perceive? You have to be able to sense. If you're not sensing it, I can do all I want with perception management. It doesn't matter. It's wasted. So um, there was a, also the notion that we have one, one uh, group of people. What we consider we have to take control, like with our cyber kill chain, we talk about uh, owning ser servers, taking over, establishing our foothold, doing all these other things. We have another group of people out there that say, um, I really want to understand the big picture overall and understand how to manage all these functions. And I don't really necessarily need to own all the functions. I need to know when is the best time that I want to do what I want to do with the function or prioritize my needs. So um, Hofstede, he was, this is the framework that I used. Um, he has six dimensions to define culture. He has 100 countries, scores from 0 to 100. It's a widely adopted framework. It was actually used in management. But it is approved by the uh, anthropology departments or the sociology departments, so they are they are familiar with his work, and they uh, the, there are criticisms to his work. I will say that, and that's why I use the other ones to help fill in the blanks because part of uh, Hofstede's very good at helping. Me, I can use his dimensions to help me uh, tell tell me what I'm seeing, um, but the why he could use a bit of improvement. So um, his why he starts he gives very broad explanations, so you have to do some more digging and find out more from the other uh, ones out there. So uh, he has six dimensions I mentioned. The first one, I'm going to do this really quickly because I don't want to spend a lot of time talking about the cultures, but I'll ha happily talk about it to anyone who wants to afterwards. Power distance. Uh, this is how egalitarian versus how authoritarian your society is. Do you, uh, do you accept that everyone is created equal or that some people are more equal than others? Um, individualism versus collectivism, what is most important when you make a decision? Or do you care most about your individual, like what, what it means for you, or maybe you and your family, or your very close circle, or do you care about what it means for you, your larger family, your community? Um, if I make a bad decision, will I bring shame upon my, uh, the people in general? Or if I make a uh, good decision, will that elevate all of us collectively? So, Masculine feminine, this is the misnamed dimension. This deals with how a society deals with conflict. Masculine societies tend to be more direct in it. Um, and they also have, these are the societies that also have very strong gender roles. And then we have our feminine societies have uh, more fluid gender roles. And that's not to say that the men are girly and the girls are man manly. It's actually that they have um, less of a, um, the women are not expected to wear makeup all the time, or they're not expected, there are not women's chores. Uh, they're, they're the, cho the housework is shared equally as is the yard work. So um, we find that the feminine countries tend to be more, um, some, we talk about some of the countries that have strong social systems, um, you know, medical, medical for all and free education and things like that. Those are countries that tend to have feminine values. You'll also find that in these countries that um, when they get into conflict, 
The masculine countries, uh, there's kind of like a, what are you going to do about it? The feminine countries are more like, let's negotiate, even if they're not negotiating in good faith. Uh, uncertainty avoidance, how do you deal with the, um, uh, the unknown? Are you curious or are you fearful? Um, this one has a lot of implications when you think about what happens when you're hacking, or I'm sorry, when you're defending. Um, Long-term orientation versus short-term orientation, just like it sounds. Um, some, some people are looking at what's important for this quarter. Some people are looking at what's important 20 years from now. And then we have our um, indulgence versus restraint. Uh, this is sometimes called your uh, closed and open societies. Who knows how to throw a party? Who, when they're throwing a party, you really can't tell. So that was me kind of making it really short because I know we're, uh, I want to get to the studies. These are just, um, I, I should probably have just cut these slides here now that I think about it. These slides here are just depicting the different colors and they're showing some of the behaviors that are associated with the high ends of the, and the low ends of the dimension. On the power distance, one of the highest, um, one of the highest um, um, power distance countries, uh, we talk about Russia's one that has, they're like 96 or something like that, for their, or 93. Um, Malaysia, I think it is, was 100. Um, we talk about the low end ones, the green countries, Israel, Austria. Um, they, we show the United States as green there, but actually the United States is a little closer to the middle. There are quite a few Western Euro European countries that are much more um, egalitarian than um, Americans are. Uh, individualism versus collectivism, just like we suggest, I, I had mentioned before. So, uh, interesting finding here on countries that are individualist. Um, we found there, there was a study done by Yu and Yang, I think it was, back many years ago in the early 2000s, I think. Um, and they actually uh, found that there's an association of creativity with individualist societies, um, and there is a uh, less creativity in the collectivist societies, and suspect, the, the suspicion is that the decisions are based on, um, that, that groups, because they are based on the, what's best for the group, this tempers some of the excesses. Um, although they were unable to explain in that study uh, things like flash mobs. So. Uh, we mentioned masculine and feminine, strong gender roles. So here we have our dark countries. Or, um, uh, see, our, uh, Japan would be an example of a very masculine culture. Um, Norway, I think. Uh, Norway, Iceland, Sweden, Finland, those are more, more of the feminine countries. Uh, humility is highly valued in these countries uh, that are uh, feminine, so they may keep it close to their vest what their skills are because they don't like to brag. Uncertainty avoidance. Uh, our dark countries, again, are the ones that are very high in, uh, they're fearful in terms of what's new and what they don't understand. So the outcome of that is when you're trying to control everything, you're going to be very precise um, because you, you want to make sure that you can control for every situation. Lighter countries are more creative, so more curious. Uh, so they tend to, they'll try anything. So we'll think about what that means when we talk about, like we're looking at um, doing some attribution work. Um, are we, would we expect countries that are very precise to uh, some of these high uncertainty avoidance countries, would we expect more surgical attacks from them than maybe we would from their counterparts who might have a lot of bloatware in their attacks? Um, long-term orientation, short-term orientation, this associates, the long-term orientation associates with holism and of course our short-term orientation, that's, um, that again associates with object-oriented thinking. And of course, indulgence versus restraint. Um, I have mentioned that the dark countries, are, they tend to be better at the math and science. They also don't like to um, telegraph much about what they're doing. And our lighter countries, um, which are the closed societies, I, oops, I have a typo here. <laughs> okay, my countries that are um, light, I'm looking at those, those actually should be my restrained ones in the, oh, no, I got it right, dark countries are indulgence. But the indulgent countries don't do close to the vest. I have my bullets mixed. They're, so they're actually, they like to celebrate in the um, indulgent countries. And so they're more willing to uh, brag about what they've done as opposed to their uh, counterparts who are more closed and keep it close to the vest, like I said earlier. Now, now we get to get to the fun part. Uh, so we have this study. Uh, we have the study data here. When I've, there were several studies that I've done because I wanted to understand a little bit more about attackers, defenders, and victims. So um, being poor and not being funded at first, I did a study looking at DNSSEC, because uh, I also like DNS. 
I have a little DNS um, addiction going on. And so I said, let's see who all just signed their zones. Because it's the first thing you do in DNSSEC. And um, if, uh, anybody familiar with DNSSEC? OK. Anybody um, actually run anything with it? <laughs> yeah. OK, so signing your zones is the easy part. Uh, managing the keys is not. Um, exchanging the keys is not. So I thought, let's see who just like thought that this would be a good idea to sign their zones, at least. And um, the uh, funny thing, I had, a f I had a friend that was working at ICANN at the time. and told him about this study and he actually shared with me that I think it was Poland not only signed their zone but they like made all the subdomains sign their zones too <laughs> so that were they the country actually did that which I thought was kind of interesting Poland being one of those high uncertainty avoidance countries so, so yeah so anyways uh, so I just looked at who signed their zones back in 2015 it was just a simple shot in time uh, working with a friend of mine and then uh, then I got because of that study and a couple other studies, I managed to get some funding from um, IORPA to do a study with um, a lot of data, and that's how I got the Zone H archive, which we'll be talking about. And I use Internet World Stats because when you're trying to look at all these populations, you want to make sure, especially if you're doing correlations, that you can at least account for, um, for the population and, and normalize your data. So, um, Zone H, let's talk about that. This is an example right here of, I'm pointing to the back of me and there's nothing behind me. So, uh, these are some examples of some of the web faces that were defaced using Zone H. And you can see here that we have uh, lots of different things we can look at that we could, um, that I had mentioned like bringing other majors in would be probably pretty relevant. Uh, symbolism on the one that looks to be something like ISIS, if it is or not, it is a Saudi, a Saudi lord is actually a Saudi Arabian citizen, um, citizen or group. Uh, the Bo Bulgarian cyber army really is from Bulgaria. Um, and you can see the very different styles of what they're doing when they're hacking the websites there. Um, here we have Iran and Turkey. Um, for those of you who are familiar with BSD, you can appreciate the uh, symbolism of the demon there. Um, you can see the Iran Mr. Terror here. That's the Iranian flag in the background. Now, you can see here that there's other information that's um, showing up on here that's kind of interesting in addition to the symbolism, right? So here they're going and they're listing other groups on Mr. Terror was here. They're listing other groups that they work with. Or they're, uh, so can we do some linkography with that, right? We have to extract it all and get it out of there. But um, that's why I said, yeah, maybe working with someone who's uh, familiar with natural language processing or linguistics in general, they can uh, extract that data out there and start grouping them. And we can start seeing these relationships between these different groups. Uh, similarly, with our friend here on uh, the, this Turkish group here, um, they're, here they're, they're telling more about themselves. They apparently like FreeBSD, Linux, um, AIX, which I don't even know if that's still around, and then they're mentioning Windows. I'm not sure, sure why. This is an example of what one of the records look like. Okay, so um, you can see that there's a lot of different things to parse through here. Um, you'll see here that on the top up here, we've got, that's the date that it was reported. This is the date that, um, once it's accepted and they, uh, Zone H says, yes, this is legitimate. We, we verified it. They will fill in that date. Uh, this is the group's handle name. So this is where the first fun part for the cyber people come in. You have to um, at, uh, do your attribution. Um, Yemeni hackers is who that YMH is. Uh, they tell you the actual site that they hacked, right? You got the domain um, and the page. And they give you the IP address of the web server that they did that with. And they're telling you what operating system they're running, what software version on that, so Linux Apache, why they did it, how they did it. And then you actually have, this is actually the mirror site that has the actual defacement on it. So uh, if you decide to ever do anything with this data, I have to tell you right now, do not click on anything on the mirror site. So uh, the malware is there. Um, which also present, presents another opportunity to download and collect the malware, get the hashes on the malware, and see what malware patterns we're also seeing, too, um, who's choosing what type of malware to use. So we have a lot that we can look at here. And there's, um, because of time, I'm not going to go through all the fields because I want to go through the studies, too. But they'll tell you if they've refaced it. If it obviously, this one was not yet published because they're waiting to make it public. Um, this is an important field right here. This is the unique identifier for the record, so you don't want to lose track of that. But um, what you can do is when you, when you go to this site here, then you can go ahead and pull all the text out of the site. You can pull the images down, and you can do whatever you want with that, too. So when I talk about um, interdisciplinary na nature here, we have something that is of interest to the data scientist, the cyber people, um, and, of course, the behavioral scientists. So on the, for the cyber people, the, uh, the cyber people have to go ahead and do all the attribution on this. 
okay? Because they're not telling you where they're from. And even if they're telling you where they're from, sometimes it's not where they're really from. So there's a Turkish group that calls themselves Canadians. They're not. <laughs> so um, there's a lot of fun things that we can do with this. And I'd love more than anything to be able to have um, a group of students that I could work with from each of the different disciplines and say, let's focus on this particular group of attackers because we've got 15 years work worth of records here, right? Um, let's look at this particular group of attackers and see, what, uh, see their progression, how they've uh, changed their style over the years, if they've changed their style at all, um, what, what have they done with their targets, how have they changed their um, output on what they're doing, because they're telling you everything here anyways. So this one took a little while, Tunavado. Um, this is a Portu uh, Paraguayan one, uh, again, and the Paraguayan, Paraguayan Brazil apparently having some issues here. We have patriotism. He chose to use a SQL injection. So um, 2014, before I got the uh, Zone H data, I didn't get the Zone H data until um, late 2014, early 2015. Um, so the Zone H data, before that, um, I, I ha we were just trying to get some interest in the work we were doing. So um, looked at some technology adoption rates and said, who's getting on to Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn? Now, Twitter was new enough at the time that I couldn't even do a correlational analysis on the Twitter data because um, it was still, we were still just getting the, the people, country, com countries were still coming online with Twitter at the time. So... Um, we looked at we looked at we used a slightly different method to evaluate Twitter than we did the other two, but Facebook and LinkedIn had been around for a while, and we had made some assu assumptions that social um, social media might appeal to people from individualist countries. Um, so we thought we'd run through and see what we actually would find. Um, so what we ended up finding was that. Um, oh, and we also, because not all of the services had been, and um, believe it or not, when we were looking for, at the early years of um, some of these things, we couldn't find, we, there were some countries who couldn't get a full 20% on the internet at the time, so uh, we had to eliminate those countries too. But here's what we found. So we found that Facebook the, uh, adopted all three social media, actually, uh, ones that we looked at, associated with indulgence. Um, so we ran a uh, correlation, and interesting thing, and here's where your data science comes in. Some of you are probably already familiar with this. None of this data is, is ever normally distributed. So we had to run Spearman correlations when we ran our correlations. And when we, had, when we did our group comparisons, we had to run Man Whitney because these are all non-parametric tools that you can use to do your evaluation. Otherwise, if you tried running a Pearson correlation, you're going to get your findings. Um, well, most, a lot of people might not know to challenge it. Your findings are not going to be accurate. So... Facebook, we found uh, the indulgence. We had a strong correlation. Um, based on human behaviors, anything above a 0.5 for your R value is considered a strong correlation in human behaviors, even though um, in straight non-human behaviors, we're looking at something closer to 0.8 to get a good strong correlation. Um, so we found that uh, we had a strong correlation on Facebook adoption. We had a moderate correlation with um, collectivism and short-term orientation for the Facebook users. We found that on LinkedIn that we had... Um, egalitarianism and short-term orientation, we also found that strong indulgence showing up. And I remember I said with Twitter, I didn't have enough data to run a long, nice long correlation on it, so I, we did the group comparisons with the Man Whitney's and we found that uh, the, <clears throat> we barely had a hit on the masculine um, dimension and we found that really strong indulgence showing up. So. DNSSEC, uh, similarly, we, uh, because we were looking at a point in time, we just did a quick r a rapid group comparison, and we found that the, the it actually found the f uh, some pretty strong findings here, that when we looked at the top-level domains and we pulled them down from ICANN and saw who signed them, we found that the countries that were low in power distance, which means they're egalitarian, and they are high in individualism, and they are long-term oriented, oriented, these countries tended to be the ones that signed their zones and their of course, their counterparts did not. So, um, I mentioned IARPA was very nice and um, bought the Zone H data from years 1999 to 2014, and there were um, uh, there's like I think there's like 12 million records in there or something like that. So, um, I they had said we want to see if we can use culture to predict kinetic events. So they also gave me a, another database to work with, and that's the um, all IQs database, which is all the global news stories. And so what we had to do is, we, uh, again, we're pulling all this together, um, and they want to see, you know, so I have to use Hofstede, have to use the Zone H data, um, 
And then we have this IQ's data. So what I did was I said, let's look at all the kinetic events that happened. Uh, anything that had that went to from like sanctions all the way up to some sort of firing of bullets. And those would be the ones that I would say are kinetic, would qualify as kinetic events. So we agreed upon that. And when we looked at the distribution for that, we found that there was um, nothing really special. It didn't deviate much from Hofstede, so I don't have to do anything special here. Um, we wanted to see what the relationship was, so um, I randomly chose, because at the time I wasn't really sure what, uh, what number, but it turned, to work, it turned out to work out well. I said, let's go, anytime there's a kinetic event, let's look for something in zone H that occurs within 30 days of it. It turns out that actually most of the occurrences occur within 14 to 15 days of an event. Um, we found, uh, also found that um, when I looked through the data, I um, had to put the pairs together by, by the top-level domain, who's fighting, so if it was um, India and Pakistan having to go at each other, is it Syria and, um, I, I don't know, Israel having to go at each other, that's how the, all the pairings were done. And then uh, looked for the top-level domains where patriotic uh, revenge or political defacement occurred, pulled those out and said, okay, if it was, if it's, um, if we use the example of India and Pakistan, I'd say, okay, look for a PK or ID, I think, I think India's ID or is it IN? I forget what their top level domain is. I think it's IN now that I think about it. Okay, look for those ones to be in there, in the set there and see where, how far they're measuring off. Uh, interesting thing, one of the interesting findings that was kind of just mentioned as an incidental was not every country leads with cyber. There's an assumption because we lead with cyber and some of our adversaries lead with cyber that everybody does, but actually found that some countries uh, led with kinetic and followed with cyber. So um, looking for what, what we can actually find here, um, I mentioned the manual uh, there's a manual attribution process. Um, at the time, none of those records had been attributed, so I spent most of my time doing the attribution on these, these groups. So the result is I have about 1,500 actors <laughs> that are attributed. Um, and yes, the um, attribution was verified. So I uh, can't share all of my sources, but I will say that every actor that it was attributed had at least three sources that uh, could, could be used to do it. And then I have a friend that worked over at uh, DIA that actually said, yeah, you got this one right. Or, yeah, so we went through them. Okay, so once I had what did I find? So um, again, I mentioned kinetic profile showed no deviation from um, Hofstede profile, which was great. Um, so what I found was attackers in general came from the authoritarian countries. They're masculine and they're uh, restrained, and the victims tended to be masculine. Um, we'll revisit this masculine on the victims later too, because we actually did a little. There was a follow-on study that was done. We had this other group of actors that showed up that were called. I call them the uninvited third parties. So if two countries are having a go at it, let's say we'll pick it on India and Pakistan, um, an Argentine hacking group might weigh in on the conflict and tell whichever side that they were um, opposing, they'd say, you're wrong, and they'd go ahead and deface the site. So we had the, this group of third parties, there was enough of them that I said, let's look and see what we can find out about these, and they tended to be authoritarian in values, they were um, masculine, and of course they were also um, from restrained societies. And then we had some that were both, we looked at both the countries that were both attackers, attacked, attackers and victims. And we found that they tended to be authoritarian and restrained. So I said, let's, uh, one of my coworkers suggested at the time, she said, why don't you trend the data, Char? I said, oh, that's a good idea. So well, we did that. So um, we, we found was as it went on, as time goes on, you see here, um, our authoritarian countries uh, th on the very short five year interval, very high in power distance, but when we look go back 10 years, they're still, it's still strong, just not as strong. So what we're finding actually was that the authoritarian countries, they actually uh, looked at this viewing, viewed this um, attacking these websites and uh, doing these patriotic and um, political type deface, defacements as this is a good thing, and so they encouraged it. Um, we, found some co we found a moderate correlation on the five-year interval with curiosity. Um, and as, at the 10-year interval, we saw that it was actually a little stronger. So that, over time, is actually getting weaker. And if you look at our five-year and 10-year on the open societies versus closed societies, we found that strong on both. But we found that, again, um, the f over 10 years, it was not as strong as it was at the first five years. Victims, again, we found a long-term, um, we found the short-term orientation on that uh, when we tried to correlate that over time, when we trended it, and we found that even though these, um, on our previous one I had mentioned that they were feminine in value, they, um, when we tried to trend what was happening over the long term, we found that it was becoming um, 
less uh, strong, more, more of the uh, short-term orientation. And of course, our uninvited. Again, I'm going to try to slip through here quickly because I know I have five more minutes to hear. Um, so we found on the uh, study that indulgent countries actually not only, uh, they actually strongly correlated with lo longer time interval. So the thought behind this is that um, when there's a country is deciding whether to respond to a kinetic or a cyber attack, and they're going to use the other method to do it. There's an awful lot of uh, generals have to and, and politicians have to decide on what they're going to do. And what we found was that the indulgent societies take longer to make that decision. The thought being that they have to uh, weigh out all the options and they actually do care about what, some, what, what everybody's saying in the room and think it through. Whereas the restrained societies, there's just somebody who's making a decision and they may listen to what you have to say, but they already made the decision and they're marching. Um, I, th this one is actually one that I'd love to do a follow-up on, with, um, and this one is the self-identified attack vector preferences. So what I did was it took, everyone's probably familiar with MITRE CYBOX, and within CYBOX they have KPEC. KPEC takes all of the different attack vectors groups them together into like 25 different groupings. And you can take those groupings, and remember we saw on our earlier records, they gave the attack vector that they used, the attackers did. So we found the ones that were common, said so let's use that, and let's look at the groups so that are self-identified. So they may say, I'm the an Ir Iranian hacker group or something like that. So I can compare them against the ones that are not self-identified e eventually. Um, and this is the study I'd like to do. And if we find that we, uh, the self-identifieds are accurate predictors of the non-self-identifieds, then we would be in a good spot to actually predict what attack vectors people want. Um, so, but I needed to have the baseline first on the self-identifieds. And so that's what this study is here. And there were some interesting findings on that. So. O-Day attacks, because I remember thinking to myself when I saw this, and it's like, who would burn an O-Day on a website defacement? <laughs> um, apparently, some people who, have, uh, who are very authoritarian and very restrained. Uh, so there, it does actually happen. The brute force attacks, I kind of ex ex expected that one to be a little more um, associated with masculine values because they don't really care what you're doing uh, if, if, you, if you're upset about it because they're very direct in their conflict. And sure enough, we did get a hit on the masculine values. Uh, configuration errors, um, strongly associated with authoritarian countries and masculine values, and the SQL injection. Again, this is one that I thought the SQL injection being a little more elegant than, say, a brute force attack might appeal to someone with high uncertainty values. And sure enough, there we go. We have our high uncertainty values. Um, and then we have our social engineering uh, associated with masculine and restrained countries. Interestingly enough, on the, um, the social engineering, one of Hofstede's uh, things when he was talking about how they, different cultures use technology different, he said that men, masculine countries tend to be more information seeking and feminine countries tend to be more information sharing. And that kind of bears that out on our social engineering results. So um, there was another study done where I was trying to get someone to get some other work done and I kind of figured if I pressured him by doing a study on social engineering victims in general, just looking at the larger set um, as opposed to just the self-identified ones, I'd see what came out, and sure enough, um, we found that victims of social engineering attacks shared these uh, common traits. They tend to be more individualist, they tend to be um, egalitarian, and they had long-term um, orientation. So um, the person I was trying to force to get along, get some things done, was a student named Mark Kalenko. He did a 10-year analysis on the victims, and what he found, uh, something he found that was overwhelmingly interesting, fascinating to me, was not only were the, did the countries of all these defacements, these government websites that have been defaced uh, using these type of various attacks, were, re uh, were masculine. Remember the former IARPA study, I know I'm talking fast. We also mentioned that the victims tended to have masculine, uh, feminine, fe Masculine values, I'm sorry. So he not only found that the masculine values were across all cultures, but this, what I found the most more significant finding was when he tried to tend, trend the value over the 10-year period, the findings were constant, which, of course, lends support to cultural values being enduring. So uh, no matter how much we try to train somebody to do something differently, these cultural values are going to go ahead and take a, overtake what we're doing here. So... Uh, whew, I've got three minutes, two minutes to get this. <laughs> okay, uh, conclusions. So these studies were exploratory in nature and they were done to create baselines for predictive studies that uh, are supposed to be underway but are not really underway because I haven't had time to do them and I have no funding to do them. 
Uh, cyber actors right now appear to have behaviors that associate with their cultural values. And this is not surprising because when we talk about how we do kinetic war, we, under we have to understand the cultural va values of the um, person on the other side. So why would cyber uh, war be any different? Cultural values may or may not uh, be perfect uh, predictors, but they do provide context and set the norms. So we, we may not be able to say that this particular actor out of this particular country, we can't predict exactly what he's going to do, but we can say he's probably not going to go there for this other thing uh, because of the norms. Uh, the reliance on data to inform the um, explanations and the behaviors, while well, relatively new, has been well received by um, parts of the U.S. government, our 5 Eye partners, and NATO. So um, with that, I'll leave you with Hofstede's famous quotes, this dominance of technology over culture is an illusion. Software of the machines may be globalized, but the software of the minds that use them is not. Um, so I think we have time for a couple of questions here. <laughs> Maybe like time for one or two questions. If anyone has questions, make sure you use your button on the left side. Yes. Yeah, interesting studies. I was wondering if you have done anything on the shock effect on the culture, whether they enforce the, the perceptions or it's going to enforce it. Is it change it or enforce it? And on the shock effects, if it, you can categorize it under different headings, whether it's going to be to the security, whether it's personal, financial, or national security, or religious sensitivities. So have you done anything on those, along I'm, those lines? or? No, I have not. Um, but I will say, since you brought up some of these other um, areas, like financial and personal and whatnot, um, there has been a misattribution or, uh, to, of motives associating certain countries with only wanting financial, and then we find out years later that actually they go after financial with us because money buys what you want, what, what you really want to get to in, in our culture, in our society, but that may not necessarily be what they do in other countries. So I know I'm not really answering your question because I'm not really, um, I, I can say I have not done those studies yet. So. No, but what I mean basically say, you say everything is money and those sort of things that you are relating, say suppose over here. But over here. how is yes. going to be the relationship with the fear? The fear interference with what people usually are going to look into, but fear, of course, in different levels. As I said, you, you can have fear of, say, health, as yes. it's going on right now, or it's financial security, or say you have your money in the bank and so all of a sudden the banks collapse or something like that. Yes. So, so those are kind of la to the larger kinetic issues, and uh, there have been other there has been other work I believe done in the social sciences that I'm not familiar with on that because I could only focus on how do I do this in the with just the cyber world, right? So, um, but we do know that some societies tend to be more fearful of everything than other societies because they just don't trust what what it's not invented there. So, have you done anything? If so, suppose that you have the say the web goes down, the, the internet, and what's going to be the effect on the people? How are they going to behave? Say, not oh, for I would a few love hours, to do that I study. mean for a few days. <laughs> yes, so um, it's, it's funny you mentioned that that study has not been done, and actually one of the things we talked about yesterday, uh, yesterday when we were uh, touring the cyber range was um, what happens, we, we didn't do, we, say, we didn't say for the internet, but uh, if you had a cyber physical attack where you took something down, uh, we look at everything in very constrained systems, but um, the, if you maybe sh uh, shut off the water supply to a town, right, uh, in cyber physical. Well, there's always that one person in town that's kind of like the survivalist, <laughs> and they have all, this, all these backup things there. So what, how would they behave in that situation? Because they would not only have enough for themselves, but they might be able to sell to the town or sell to other people in the town. And then that, that would be a very interesting study just to see how the different, um, the wild cards would act in this situation. And then would we be able to um, maybe have our National Guard be able to take this information and figure out before things go crazy in the town, how to um, get some semblance of normality working with that person first. So, no, those studies have not been, uh, the, as I know, they have not been done. So, but yeah, it is. I a, have a lot of questions, but just one more, one more thing. I'm saying that suppose something big happens, as you say, yeah. kinetic or whatever, and then what are the chances that they shut down the whole internet? or they sense it in certain aspect, or just the financial part? So again, it depends on the country that we're talking about and the values of the people who are done this. So if you have something major that happens, 
Like we already have a history in the Middle East where um, Iran has shut, you know, has closed off the internet. We had, uh, I believe, it was um, Egypt closed, shut it down. Turkey. Turkey. Okay. Um, I, I think Turkey was more recent, right? Um, so when we know that these countries that tend to be more authoritarian in nature, they will shut down the internet. If that happened in America, I can tell you right now they're not shutting down the internet because it costs way too much money and there is no way the, um, the financial community would put up with that. So um, we will work to, have, to work around it and we may uh, do something like we, we may reduce some of the services or uh, change the prioritization of the traffic that comes in, but we will keep the internet up <coughs> just because that's our value system. So. Okay, thank you. Sure. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. There you go. Uh, what is the uh, what is the methodology to actually verify the uh, the ground truth? Because I understand that you know the data driven analysis uh, yes. has to be verified uh, against the ground truth. I'm always technically cur uh, curious, you know, how uh, the ground truth uh, acquisition <laughs> is done. And then the second question is that uh, uh, will you worry about deception, meaning that if our adversaries uh, become aware of the knowledge or the information that we derive out of this study, mm -hmm. what kind of of a change they might, what kind of a strategy they might adopt, right, to actually avoid uh, future, uh, you know, attribution or being accurately profiled, at least. Right. So they would have to, uh, that's a very good question, and it's a two-part question, so we'll start with the ground truth one. Um, when we first uh, started this, this exercise, um, the Zone H data was at sealedattrition.org. That was recognized as a source of ground truth data. Mm -hmm. um, but even with that, like I said, I had to attribute the different actors who yeah. were saying they, 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 that they had actually uh, admitting to doing the attack. So to that, I would look for, I, I looked for news stories, I checked the social media. Uh, again, these could all be falsified, but then I had that other thing in my hip pocket called my friend that worked at, at DIA, mm -hmm. and so then I ran the list past him too. Mm -hmm. Um, some of the groups that were really hard to do, like I, I showed you um, to Nevada, I had a friend at the University of Warwick that actually spent a lot of time going through social media as well as other sites to uh, look to see what he could find on that one. Uh, he actually, on some of the Arab gr Arabic groups, he found that um, some of them were really into um, cars. So he joined the different clubs on cars so that he could, and he actually is a native Arabic speaker too. So he was, we were able to do a lot of, you know, there was a, when I say it was painstaking, because out of 11 million records, we only have 1,500 actors yes. attributed. So that's, you know, um, so that, that's the first part mm -hmm. of it. Um, and, and some of the early ones, too, I even looked to see if they had been convicted. Uh, look for, because if they had been convicted, yeah. that's, that's your last, uh, yeah. you know, that's a sure point of uh, ground truth. Now, on the actual uh, news story, the other piece was you said something about, uh, was that was the ground truth, right? Yeah, so we, mm -hmm. okay, yeah. ground truth data, the uh, customer said, look, we're going to use IQs, the news stories. Uh, that's one source of uh, ground truth data. And he, they actually uh, specified the Zone H data as a source of ground truth data, even though I had to do the attribution piece. Yeah. On the victim side, you don't have to do as much to verify it because you could just you, you see the site that you have the domain, and then you can just go to the uh, mirror site, verify it, and you know, okay. So that's like you know top level domain. That's yeah. that's a lot easier to do. So. Um, but on the victim site, interestingly enough, something I didn't share about Zone H because we were uh, kind of rushed. There's a field in there that gives the country at the very end. It spells it out. Like it might, um, I think the example I used to had uh, Saudi Arabia was the country that was attacked and then it said United States. Mm -hmm. Well, what that means was that the server was actually physically housed in the United States. So when I had the student doing the 10-year study on the victims, Zone H data only gives the country where the server is housed from the years... 2010, I think, up to 20, up to present, and we only had up to 20, the end of 2014. Everything else, he had to go back and look and, and find out what was the um, a, um, autonomous system number associated with those, that uh, group of IP addresses and see if that autonomous system at number matched one of the countries that would have that, that would be able to uh, dole out those IP addresses. So that was uh, a bit of an exercise for him because he's not a programmer either and I told him I was I, I did some, I did help him a little bit with some of the cleaning but um, I find that in general data cleaning is is the biggest task in this in doing yep, something exactly. like this so so that was how we got through the ground truth on those so okay thank you any other questions
questions? Okay. Thank, thank you for your time. Yeah. Thank you.